uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, Celo, uh, which is a new programming language, uh, which is basically what, you know, we try to think of it as, what if we started Java today, but, you know, remember the experience we had from the 10 or 12 years of Java. Um, so as I said, what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what is Ceylon? Uh, why did we start yet another language? Uh, where we are at? We'll show you a, a bunch of the features. There are many, many, many features in Ceylon, so we had to handpick the most interesting ones. Uh, so you'll get a you know, pretty decent look and you know, feeling of what, uh, what Ceylon is about. And um, because the language is not just a vaporware, we act are actually going to write down a, a demo live and make it work. Huh? Good. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about the community and where we are at, uh, you know, compared to other languages and things like that. Uh, so my name is Emmanuel Bernard. I work for, <laughs> I was actually reading my name. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I work for JBoss. I'm initially part of the Hibernate team, but I'm doing everything around data these days. So trying to coordinate a few things and uh, still trying to code on, uh, especially on Hibernate OGM, which is the uh, no relational, uh, sorry, the no SQL approach for Hibernate, the experiment we're doing here. Uh, I'm doing a bunch of work on the standardization in the JCP, and I do animate a few podcasts. So. Hi. Hello. Uh, my name is Stephanie Pardo. Uh, I've been working on a few open source projects, such as uh, RestEasy and uh, Salon, and a few others that I... I uh, uh, started like uh, Jack Stocklets. Uh, I've been contributing to Salon since uh, May 2011, so a year ago, um, uh, which was roughly a month after it hit Slashdot. I don't know if you, you guys remember, if, if you even know Slashdot anymore. I've, I've had the, the, the news that it's been, you know, it's, it's out it's now. It's, it's, it's ready like, these days. Yeah. So. Um, so I remember I, I saw this thing on Slashdot, and then I, I looked at the, the slides that Gavin uh, wrote for uh, China, for a conference in China, and I was very interested, so I sent him an email saying, you know, uh, how can I try this? He's like, well, yeah, it's, it's a bit hard because we don't have a compiler at the moment. Like, excellent, can I write the compiler? <laughs> so that's, that's what I do these days. I write the uh, JVM compiler. Uh, we have actually a JavaScript compiler as well, so uh, we'll talk about more about that later on. And then a bunch of tools like uh, Salon Doc and Herd, which we'll present later on. Good. So, um, Salon came from the you know, kind of the frustration we had when we were working on CDI on the you know pretty advanced. Uh, I mean, specification that we're using a pretty advanced feature of Java with regard to the type system, and. Um, you know, we try to take a step back and say, you know, what would we do if we could start Java from, from scratch today? And Gavin, you know, started working with, on that and uh, interacting with a, a few other people at, at, um, at JBoss. And, uh, you know, that, that literally where, where it come from. So if we had to summarize Salon, we, we found those uh, six words, uh, which I think are, are good summaries. Uh, the first thing is that it's a, it's a very powerful language, uh, much more type safe than, uh, than Java uh, in many ways, and with some features that are, that are extremely powerful and um, you know, gives you much more freedom in the way to express what you want to do uh, inside the language. Um, the type system is actually not Java's type system, but our own type system, which is, has some interesting features like union types that we're going to talk about later. Uh, it's readable. Um, our, our motto was to say, uh, most of, you, you spend most of your time actually reading the code you, somebody else has written or most probably that you have written but forgotten, right? So the key feature is to make it easily, easy to read, uh, I mean easy enough to write but make it extremely easy to read. Um, even sometimes at the expense of not being too compact, right? If, it's, if, it, if we have to add a bit of verboseness to be more readable, we will do that. Uh, it's predictable in the sense that um, we try to keep the rules simple. Um, the, the hidden goal is for, uh, for Stefan not to have too much of a hard time to write the compiler. But the good side effect is that um, because the rules are so simple, having, we, we don't have too, much, too many corner cases. We don't have that many features. They are, each of them are quite powerful, but that means the you know, interception of the various features don't end up being... Uh, too much of a mess to try to, to work out. 
Uh, but Ceylon is not only a language. We're really thinking big in this area. And what we really want to do is a full platform. So our goal is to actually also rewrite the, what you guys call the JDK. So we want to have a, we, we're working on a Ceylon SDK that will actually reuse all of the features of Ceylon and provide something much fresher than the, uh, uh, the, the JDK we have today. If you think about it, Java actually aged, aged pretty well. The JDK, not so much, right? A lot of things should be deprecated. Um, one other thing we've done is that we, we've put modularity at the core of the language. Uh, you know, today you have Maven, and then you get your dependency from somewhere, and so on and so on in Java, but the compiler doesn't know about that. What we did in Ceylon is integrate modularity at the heart of everything, including the compiler. So the compiler literally is able to read data from a re uh, remote repository, push data to a remote repository, so that every single tool can actually reuse the same logic, right? And because of the strong type safety and because of some of the decision we made, the Ceylon is actually very easy to, uh, to build tool for. And actually, we do have, um, um, I, uh, sorry, Eclipse-based IDE as well as, you know, common line tools for, for that. So let's have a look at uh, Ceylon uh, as, a, as a language. Um, if you look at that, it should look fairly familiar to you. And that's one of our goals. And one of our goals is actually to make the language very readable for Java developers or even C-based developers. Um, let's do something a bit more complicated, a bit more realistic. There is a few things you might not do, I mean, you do not use in Java, like shared. Uh, but, you know, you can imagine it looks like public. You know, that must be something around that. Uh, the actual class name has parameters. That's probably look like a, the constructor. And um, the actual attributes are the, have the same name as the parameter. This one is a bit harder to guess, but uh, we, what, hap what happens is that we actually set the value from the constructor values automatically. Um, where is the constructor, by the way? So instead of having a kind of an ad hoc syntax to write the constructor, what, what we thought about is to make Ceylon extremely regular as far as the grandma is concerned to uh, a, simplify our work, and B, uh, make it much more regular and readable. So in this case, you know, where do you put the body of a method? Well, within the method boundaries. Where do you put the body of a class, the body of a class being the actual constructor of this class, then you actually put it in the class. So at the beginning of the class, you literally have the curl of the, the constructor, and then you carry on with the actual method. Um, the other thing we've seen, which is a bit different, is the idea of shared. Um, because we have modularity, we uh, try to rethink the notion of visibility inside Ceylon compared to Java. A, we, we very much dislike the default values with regard to visibility in Java. Uh, plus, adding yet another keyword was not really something we were uh, okay with. So instead, we uh, we use one keyword, which is shared. And the idea is kind of using Russian doll strategy, where everything that is marked as shared will be visible by everyone that um, can seize the encompassing elements. So if we look at an example, uh, in the class foo, I've got a Baz uh, method, which is not shared. So it's private and not visible by other people. But the bar method is actually shared, so it's vis visible everywhere foo is actually visible. So the class who can see the class foo and then can call bar. Um, but because the class foo is also shared, it means it can be seen not only within the same package, but also across packages. In this case, the class action can actually go and call bar. Make sense? And it's a actual, you know, the rule is actually much more simple. In about one sentence, you can describe it in the specification. Um, of course, we have um, attributes. Um, what they are is literally properties, right? The getters, the setters in Java, which are convention-based, are actually enforced in the language. That's something fairly, fairly standard with any new language these days. Um, an interesting feature of the attribute is that they are immutable by default. We try to enforce immutability to you know, help with regard to scalability down the road. Um, of course, not everything can be written in an immutable way. Um, so you can actually make a, an attribute uh, mutable, but you have to specify that it's a variable. And you have to use the uh, assignment operator, which is different than the, uh, you know, the, the, the operator used for scale here. 
Okay, so we really want to make it explicit for you that you're using a mutable state versus an immutable state. Again, we want it to be readable so that in, you know, very quickly you realize, oh, that's a mutable state, so if I share this state, you know, between different threads, I need to be careful about that. And of course, if you want to customize the code of the getters and the setters, then you can do that. Uh, but that's, uh, thank you. But that's, uh, that's, you know, that's the minor case. The interesting case is really integer scale, which is the immutable attribute, and the other one, the variable one. Um, let's talk about inheritance. Where well, there's nothing fancy about inheritance, you can create subclasses. Uh, the only difference is that instead of calling super from the constructor, we actually use a, a bit more compact syntax to say, you know what, point 3D actually would call the super dot, you know, the, the super com uh, constructor of point uh, with those parameters. Yes, I'll talk about that in a minute. That's a good point. Um, of course, you can have, you can override, you know, potentially method attributes. Uh, well, you can override method like you can do in Java. Um, you can also override attributes because attributes are very much like methods. Think of the getter. That's a method, so you can override that. More interestingly, you can also override classes. Um, we did that because a, that was possible, and A, it makes the language much more uh, regular uh, in this stage. And it's also a nice way to do the, a factory pattern where you define the actual class implementation differently depending on uh, how you override stuff. One thing we changed, though, is that by default, a, a construct is not overridable. Uh, you can override it, but uh, you have to specify that explicitly. If you have put a default implementation, then you just use the default keyword to say this stuff can be overridden by a subclass. Uh, if you don't have an actual implementation but want subclasses to actually implement it, then you use the formal keyword for that. So again, we want to be extremely explicit here. And when you override something, you need to say that's the, that is the actual implementation. So we use the actual keyword for that. Uh, if you... Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, Stefan was telling me that these are not keywords, so to speak, these are annotations. Uh, the language has actually very, very few keywords. That's a minor detail. Um, there is a difference between Java's override and the actual operator, uh, uh, annotation in Ceylon, uh, is um, the fact that you must put it if you are actually overriding something. So it's kind of an optional check in Java that's totally enforced in Ceylon to, to reduce the kind of uh, you know, bug you would get. So that's an example. So we've got shape, which is the abstract class, and you got A, a formal method. Uh, so it's, it's named formal. And then uh, a default attribute implementation of string, which is the equivalent of two string in Java. Uh, that is A, uh, overridden from the you know, super object, and B, that I I'm okay to be overridden. So I'm, it's an actual, actual default string. Uh, and Square actually override those two. By the way, the difference between a method and an attribute is the parentheses at the end of it. That's how you can easily recognize them. So as uh, somebody mentioned in, in the audience, we do not, uh, we, you can have only one constructor pair uh, class because the construct, the call of the constructor is actually within the body of the class. It actually goes beyond that. You can have only one method of a given name inside a class. And when you think about Java, you're like, well, but I'm using overloading everywhere, so you know, how can I do that? And B, why did, why did you remove this feature? This feature actually turns out to be to make the compiler and the rules much, much more complex and make all the features either impossible or much harder to do. So instead, we decided to get rid of this feature by rethinking why you actually want to use these features. And <laughs> that's interesting. We need to speed up because 20 minutes to finish the demo is going to be interesting. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, overloading. Um, the two main use cases you use overloading for are to simulate something like optional parameters. Basically, you've got a very complex uh, complete method, but you want you know, a, a much simpler way to access it with some default value, so not having to repeat this kind of default everywhere. Um, Ceylon actually has uh, default 
uh, default parameters values and uh, also as name parameters. We'll see an example down the road. Uh, the second use case you, you use overloading for is to be able to use different implementation depending on the subtype of a class hierarchy. Um, we also have a different way to do that. A, we have type cases, which is kind of a switch for the type. So if I'm of type, you know, this subclass, then do this code, otherwise do that code. The advantage of that is that the compiler actually checks that you actually support every single subtype. If you don't support one of the subtype, the compiler fails. Uh, the second feature that is an awesome feature that I, I wish I have in, in Java just about every other day is union types, but we're going to talk about that a bit later. Um, these are optional parameters that I was talking about. In this case, I've got a class rectangle which has two default parameters with default value that are put in, inside the, the constructor parameters. So I can actually call the parameters without any value, uh, any uh, cons uh, parameter value, and I get a rectangle of size two by three. By the way, that's a constructor. There is no new keyword. A constructor is very much like a method. It is actually a method that returns an instance of rectangle. So the way to call it from, uh, um, uh, from Selen is just to call the method and be done with it. So if I have two integers there and, and only one of them has a default and the other one doesn't, and isn't that ambiguous because I can also have the other one So I believe the rule the rule is that you put the one with the default values at the end of the method. And I guess if you start to define one, you will have to define all of them. Yeah. But you can only have default parameters at the end. of uh, at the end. So non-defaults have to be first. Because if you call it uh, with uh, sequential uh, parameters, then you need to give all the non-default first. But you can reduce the ambiguity by the, using the second technique, which is literally using name parameters. The syntax is slightly different. We use brackets instead of uh, parentheses. Yes, it's most, mostly for another interesting feature of Seren, which is a very nice way to represent uh, tree-like structures. We'll see an example down the road. And here I can say explicitly, I'm overriding the height uh, parameter with the value 4. And of course, the width parameter has not been overridden in this case. Okay? And it's, it replaces in many ways the build-up pattern you have to do manually uh, in Java. Um, another feature we have is um, the fact that you, you know, it, many times in, in, in Java or the you know similar languages, you you tend to duplicate some of the some of the logic here. You could actually use an abstract class to um, uh, factorize that, uh, but you usually don't do it because you can only have one. Um, you know, one abstract class per, per uh, hierarchy. Um, what Selen lets you do is provide a default implementation for a given, a given method. Um, in this case, figure 3D has default implementation for volume. I can override it in any of the subclass, but otherwise the default implementation is, is, um, is inherited. So that means that somehow we've got multiple inheritance. That's okay, don't worry. What we have is actually a subset of multiple inheritance that you, you, know, you might remember from C++. We do not share state. We actually share the actual implementation of a method. Um, and every time there is an ambiguity in Selen, we just, the compiler says, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do, so please make it explicit in your code, either the one you want to use or actually just override the, uh, uh, the method. Sounds like the default method in Java. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, that, Default method in Java came a bit later, but uh, yeah, that's pre pretty much similar to that. Yeah, except I think they changed the, well, if I kept up properly, um, up to date properly, I think they changed the syntax and they don't let you write code in interfaces. Now you have to point to a, a static method. They changed it back again, okay. Okay. Anyway. Um, <coughs> Yeah, that's one thing I wanted to show you is the extreme regularity of Selen. So this code doesn't make any sense. The, the, the key point is that you can take a bit, bit of code and put it within a class that would be the constructor code and put it within a method that would be the method body call. And yes, I can have classes within method and so on and so on. And they, believe it or not, there are actually nice use cases for that. <laughs> um, the one that is more interesting is uh, that's a table in HTML. 
So instead of having an XML or some kind of template outside Ceylon, here within Ceylon you can actually describe those kind of uh, hierarchical structures. So UI style descriptors or even you know, XML based data based descriptors, let's say JSON, can actually be written in Ceylon in a, in a very nice way and type safe. Um, yes, well, we try to do useful things. So. <laughs> Uh, so that was a brief introduction, but another cool stuff about Ceylon is that the type system is sound, and, uh, and Stefan will give you, a, I guess, a quick, a quick demo. Quick? Well, I don't know if it's going to be quick. Um, so now that everybody is warm, you know, uh, we can uh, go on with the uh, real meat of the, uh, of the problem. We have 150 slides of Greek, mostly, to explain the semantics of the language, so I hope everyone's ready. No, no, this is, uh, this is an intro to Salon. Uh, we're not going to go deep into the, uh, the, the spec. Um, let's see, instead of doing that, let's see a few things that you would notice if you start using the language. So for instance, you can call methods on literals, on number of literals. What does this tell us? This tells us that we have no light anymore. This is getting very That's too interesting. Expensive, man. They're going to cut the, the projector <laughs> in a minute. Um, so let's make it quick. Uh, it tells us that we don't have primitive types, so there's no special hole in the type system for special things like primitives. Uh, everything is an object, you know, turtles all the way down. And the thing is that uh, underneath, of course, we optimize it to primitives whenever we can, so it's still fast, but you don't have to deal with that. Um, the second thing here on the second line, you can see that we're building a sequence of strings. Um, and there is some type inference there because we're not repeating the type of the sequence on the right. And it may look like it's the same as in Java 7 where, you know, Java would, would look on the left side and decide that, you know, what you're putting on the left side is the type so you don't need to repeat it. But it's, it's really very different because we're actually not looking at the left side at all here for type inference. We're looking inside the sequence. Um, so you will see later on why this matters. We have intervals as well, and if you're lazy like me, then you can use uh, function or value keywords instead of specifying the type name of the uh, return value of, uh, of private methods or, or attributes, and then the compiler will look at the right side and decide, okay, you're putting a cube in there, so makecube must be returning a cube, and you're calling makecube, which returns a cube, so the type of cube2 is a cube as well. There's no, I have to point out that this is not dynamic, you know, this is really static. The compiler knows exactly what you're doing and it's, it doesn't change at runtime. Um, one of the things we're trying to, to do in Salon as well is to, to save people from dying because of null pointer exceptions that happen at the wrong time, you know. Uh, the, the, the problem with null pointer exceptions is that usually you, you get them at the wrong time. So you get an object somewhere, you store it, you think it's, it's, it's fine, it's safe, and then you pass it around and a couple times, and then much later down the road you try to access it and that's where it crashes, you know. So debugging is, is hard because you have a crash that's not at the same place as, you know, when you obtain the, the, um, the item in the first place. So that doesn't help you. So what we're doing in Salon is that whenever you see something of type cube, you know, it cannot contain no, right? It always has to contain a cube. If you want to have something of type cube or null, then you need to put a question mark at the end. So when you see cube question mark, it means it could be cube, it could be null. And of course the information propagates down the road. So if you de define an attribute cube that could be null or not, um, then it's cube question mark. And if you try to access uh, properties of cube, such as the area, then the compiler will not let you because you, know, you don't know it could be null. So the first thing you need to do is to check if it exists. You know, if the cube exists, then it's not new. And then you, we allow you to access what's in the inside. Um, this if thing is, is a bit special because it actually refines the type of cube within the body of the if. You know, within the body of the if, cube is not of type cube question mark anymore, it's cube. You know, why is it just cube? Because the compiler knows that you checked for it. You know, so you don't need to repeat it or downcast it or do something. You know, we know that. Um, 
We have a bit of sugar to help you deal with uh, neural safety. So we have the else operator, for instance, which is a bit like the groovy Elvis operator. So cube would be cube or no cube if it returns something. But if it doesn't return anything, then we'll make it a cube of two. Um, neural safe access as well. You can access the area attribute of maybe cube. You know, if it's not nil, then you access the area, which is of type float. But if maybe cube is nil, then the re return of this expression will be nil. Therefore, the type of area is float or nil, depending on if maybe cube is defined or not. Um, so what can we do with lists? Uh, we have, uh, let's say we have a list of numbers, one to three. Uh, we can access sublists, so one to two or one to the end. We can do something a bit more interesting, a bit like map spread thing, where we can call this, uh, read the successor attribute of each of the elements of the number. That gives us a new sequence. So in this case, successors, successor is plus one. So it's really boring. So we'll have a sequence of two, three, four, right? Because we read one successor, two dot successor, three dot successor, did a new sequence. And if we can do that with attributes, we can do that with methods as well, right? So we can call minus two on each of the elements in numbers. So we'll have minus one, zero, and one. Where's the, the rest thing? That's one until the end of the sequence of numbers. So we'll, right, uh, no, so we'll have two and three until, you know, the sequence of numbers is bounded. It's one, two, three. So we'll have from index one until the end of the sequence. So, you know, many times you have to do size minus one. That's the kind of thing we wanted to get rid of. Um, so you can also do functional programming in Salon. Um, this is an example of things that, you know, people familiar with JavaScript would have no problem with. You know, the, the biggest, uh, most successful programming, uh, functional programming language now uh, is JavaScript. Everyone's using it. Everyone knows what a function is. Everyone knows how to create functions and deal with it as first class methods. So, not my you know. Mother, you know. Not, you know. She doesn't do JavaScript. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> she should. She only does plain HTML. Um, so, here we have a project map, which is a hash map, for whatever. Uh, we read all the keys of that. And then we are, so the keys are probably going to be a set. We're going to filter all the keys, which means that we're going to call a function. And that function is going to take a key and tell us whether we keep it or not. So if the key contains a URL, then we're going to keep that key. And we're going to map it. So we're going to transform all the keys that we kept by calling a function that will access, well, actually, OK. Sorry, I need to debug this uh, presentation here. So it's a. And here as well. Um, okay, whatever. Um, so we access then the, um, the project map again and get the value pointed to by the key. Um, this sort of thing is, is pretty straightforward for people familiar with JavaScript because the syntax is uh, similar. But we also have a, a different syntax to do exactly the same thing, filter and map, but in a more inter uh, imperative way that doesn't hide the algorithm so much. So for instance, they are called comprehensions. Uh, in the second part, we're doing exactly the same part as in the first, except with a typo. Um, we're going to iterate all the keys in project map, and for each of the key that contains URL, then we're going to read the value of that key in the map. And that gives us a list, right? So we're going to briefly talk about some of the type system. You know, it's, it's a pretty, uh, we have a lot of cool features in the type system, but I cannot talk about all of them. Uh, one of those that is very interesting is the uh, union types. Uh, union types allows you to be able to hold values among a list of types. So for instance, you could have something which is of type A or type B. And before you can use it, you need to check whether it's type A or type B. So for the anecdotes, uh, type question mark, so what we saw earlier, the question mark at the end of a type, 
It's, it's actually an alias, it's just syntactic trigger for type or nothing, where nothing is the type of null. So whenever you see cube question mark, it's cube or nothing. Right, um, let's, let's move on and then you will probably see the, the answer. Um, so let's see an example of what we can do with union types. Uh, here we have a, an apple that you can eat and a garbage that you can throw away. Um, let's define a sequence of apple and garbage. And here what we have because of type inference, I could put value boxes and you wouldn't see the type of this sequence, but because of type inference, you know, we're looking inside the sequence, what's in there. We have apple, we have garbage. So the type of that is a sequence of apple or garbage, right? We can have both types of elements in the sequence. So if we iterate all those boxes, we have a box which is of type apple or garbage. What can we do with it? We can read the string attribute. Why? Because they have a common subtype which is object which defines string. So string is well defined. Um, but if we want to call methods of an apple, we need to check is it an apple first? You know, so we do is apple and if it's an apple then we can call eat. And that's again a case where we have type refinement within the body of the if because the type of box is refined. It's not box or something else anymore. It's, it's, it's apple, you know. It's, it's not apple or garbage, it's apple because the compiler knows. So this is a case where in, in Java you would do an instance of and then you would do a typecast. You know, here you don't need to. Um, and we have another thing called intersection types and this is best described with an example. So we have, um, stick to the food metaphor. Uh, so we have food that you can eat and drink that you can drink. <coughs> And, you know, if, well, I guess maybe people are not that familiar with Guinness here in the US. Uh, Guinness is a, is a drink from England or Ireland, which is really thick, you know. So once you've had a Guinness, you usually have, you know, you're not hungry anymore. So it's, it's, it's a bit like soup, right? So it's, it's both food and drink. Um, so you can drink it, you can eat it, and, and this, this type of thing, which is both food and drink, and you don't really care what's in there, you can express it in the language. You can say, okay, I want something which is food and drink because I want to eat it, I want to drink it. It could be soup, it could be Guinness, it could be anything, you don't care. As long as it satisfies both interfaces, then you're fine with it. That's the first language that supports Guinness. Yeah. The Guinness is a feature of Salon. Right? I don't know if it's me or you, but... I have, I have no idea. Um, so we have a lot more features, obviously type parameters, we saw it br uh, briefly. Uh, introductions, attribute and method reference, uh, annotations which are uh, a lot more powerful than in Java because you can run real code in there. Uh, we have a type safe meta model interception, tons of stuff that I won't have the time to talk about today. Um, but I want to, to talk a bit more about modularity. Emmanuel started talking about that and this is something that is very important. You know in, in, in Java you have classes which belong to a package and then this package belongs to nothing. But in, in Salon it actually packages belong to modules. You know. And, and within your module then you would define which modules you import and what you export. And, and this is something w in the language from the start. So, yeah, so it's not going to be in Salon 9. No, right, it's, it's <laughs> not in Salon 7 and then 8 and then 9 and then who knows. Um, it's, it's already in there, you know, and, and all the tools know how to use it. The IDE knows how to read and write to repos, even remote ones. Um, the, the, the command line tools also know how to deal with that, so you don't need some, to plug something else to, to make everything modular. And the SDK is modular from, from the start. And so actually, uh, make us rethink a lot the SDK to make it uh, as each module as minimal as possible to avoid, um, you know, to avoid doing something too big. Uh, another reason we rethought the SDK is because we support both J JVM and also JavaScript, and you cannot write. I mean, you, some stuff cannot be implemented in JavaScript. So having a very nicely isolated module uh, actually made our life harder initially, but much easier down the road. Right. Um, so this brings us to Herd. Uh, what is Herd? Herd is our next gen module repo. It's already available on modules.salonlang.org and the tools if you download Salon are, are already using it. Um, what we wanted to do was to do a, a module repo that is intuitive and good looking, a bit like GitHub, uh, which is an example that we copied a lot. 
um, and make it collaborative as well. You know, because we're doing open source. Open source is is something that is very social. You know, you, so you want to be able to to follow what people are doing, keep up with uh, with the new versions that come out and everything, and, and communicate with the authors. So. And it's free software. So this this extremely cool thing that we have running at modulesalonlang.org, you can download it and run it privately or publicly if you want and do whatever you want with it. So it's, uh, you know, we encourage you to use the same tools that we're using, obviously. And fix our bugs. If you and fix our bugs, please, yes. Oh, we don't have any bugs. Um, okay, so, you know, enough talking. Let's uh, show a bit uh, some of Salon running. So what happens uh, if you want to try Salon? Then you would go to the um, you would go to the Eclipse Marketplace, for instance, or go to our uh, website and find our update site. But if you go to the marketplace and you search for Salon, then you fall on, on, on you find our plugin, you click install, and then boom, you have the same thing as I as I do here. So you have an Eclipse uh, base IDE. Let's uh, start using it. So we're going to create a new new project, new salon project. Are you collecting all the demo you've done since? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping them because you know every so often I get a demo that doesn't work. I need to use the, the previous <laughs> one. Um, so we have here a demo. I think I call them with dashes usually. Well, who cares? Um, so I create a new project, and here I have a list of repositories that it, it will use from the start. But because I, I don't think I have very good internet here, I'm going to use a um, local instance of her that we'll use later on. So I have created my new salon project. Now I'm going to create a new module. I use very uh, unique um, names for the um, for the modules. You know, very nice, easy to remember. Uh, I think it's the one and version two. Right. So we, what do we have here when I created a new uh, module? We have a module descriptor here that tells us that this is the name of the module and this is the version. We have a package descriptor which tells us that this package is shared, so it's exported outside the module. And we have, you know, this uh, optional thing that, you know, you can have a runnable function, uh, a r function with no parameters, and then we allow you to run it. So we have something here. But by the way, our Java doc or Ceylon doc is actually uh, an annotation, and what's inside is uh, Markdown. So let's see if this runs. Okay, can everyone see, by the way, or do I need to increase the font size? Yeah? Okay. So we have here, run it, it's there. We have something, it's, it's hello world, it's really boring as hell, let's try to do better. Uh, the command line parameters are available in, a, in an object, a top level object called process. Um, so we have here the local instance of herd, and we're going to see if we, uh, we, you know, I think herd has an API, right, search modules, that spits out some JSON, so we're going to try to use this API in, in, in our application, right? So let's see if we have anything that deals with internet. Okay, so we have a net module in, in herd. Let's use this. What? So the auto completion is based on the remote repo and you look at the versions? Yeah, yeah. the right. auto completion will query all the repos that we have and ask for the list of, of stuff that matches. Um, so now we're going to. So within the language, you define your dependency, right? It's not an external thing, stored in XML or whatever. Let's copy it from here. Yes, please. So what I'm, I'm doing here is I'm parsing the URI as, as something that is uh, more meaningful. 
And now I'm going to try to access it. So I'm going to call the get method, which gives me an HTTP request, which I'm going to execute, which gives me a response. So this is a URI, you know. Um, let's see what we have in the contents of this response. I can't see anything with the uh, contents. Right. So we print what we get from there. Right. So now I've queried the uh, the thing, and I have some JSON as plain text. You know. Okay. So it's this is this is not very good. I can do better than where is it? Can do better than this. You know. Surely there is something in her that lets me deal with JSON. Excellent. So we have a JSON module. Let's use that. This one. So what I'm going to do here is import a few things from the uh, JSON module. And I'm going to parse the JSON into something more interesting. By the way, so Steph Stefan used a lot of auto-completion here. Uh, but there's also a, a few, uh, I don't know how we call that, but hints or quick fixes. Yeah. Right, that we have also implemented to help yeah, there's, you. There's a ton of quick fixes in this thing. Um, so we have some JSON here. Now let's see what we can do with this. Uh, if I remember correctly, what we need to do is we need to access the results or the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, well, let's, let's, no, we don't print it anymore. Okay. If I print it again, I don't remember what's in there. Right. So we have something which is a JSON object, and we have the, let's print all the names of the modules, right? So we have the results, which is an array and contains objects of type module. So what we do here is that we're going to check that the list of modules is an array. So we're going to access results and check that it's really an array. And if it's an array, then I can iterate every element. So what, what is the type of JSON then? Right. Interesting question. The type of JSON is just object, and the type of modules is just array. But the type of each element within this array is a union type. If, if you've ever done some JSON, then you would know that the spec specifies that it could be a string, Boolean, integer, float, object, array, or nil and nothing else. You know, it's one of those, but it's nothing else. If you wanted to express this thing in Java, you would say object. You know, that's the common subtype of each of those. Uh, we're a lot more precise here. We can say that it's one of these and it's nothing else. You know, it can't be an elephant. So, which is really sad, because that, that, would, that would work elephants out. Elephants are good. Right. Yeah. Uh, so if it is an object, then let's print. So it's object in the JSON sense of object, not yeah. the actual top level class. Uh, let's print its name then. So no done casting here. We just verify yeah. the type and then we go right, right and use it. Um, so we're here I'm accessing the, uh, the name and it tells me that, you know, I can't I call print with something that could be nil. Well, I know it's not nil, you know, it's, it's, I, I know its name. So why is it getting in the way, you know? It, well, okay, whatever. I'll, I'll give it a default value. Well, this is, I don't know why we still have the question mark here. Okay, oh, oh, that's why it was nagging me, you know, because, you know, programmers make mistakes. So we actually do have to, you know, figure out that it's actually not called name, but it's called module. So it's a good thing that it actually tried to get me to handle this case. So now we have all the list of the modules. Um, so this is how we traverse uh, some JSON, for instance. And let's give another example of how we build some JSON. We're going to describe this talk today. And so we're going to build a new JSON object. Uh, we have a title for this talk, which is Intro to Salon. 
And we have speakers, which is an array. Ooh. Well, we, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that went wrong. OK. People are going to, to think that we have weird operators. Um, so it looks we like a special syntax, but no, it's actually a standard Celon. Uh, we just use the uh, name parameter approach, and then we pass, in this case, uh, what you would get as Java enums, uh, sorry, Java entries, like a tuple. Yeah, the, the, the arrow thing is just uh, syntactic sugar for create an instance of tuple of two. You know? So a key value. And if I run this, then I can see that we have this JSON object printed properly. And what's, what's funny with this is that, you know, because what you can put in, in, in uh, JSON is really typed, it can be only one of those things. You can't be, so, number of bugs found during the demo, for instance, we can say that we didn't find any bugs. You know, this is correct. We can put uh, strings, we can put arrays. What we cannot put is something that doesn't fit, you know, that is not one of those string or boolean or something. If I try to put anything like response object, that doesn't work. You know, everything is read, the compiler tells us, no, cannot put something like that. You can put a boolean, you can put integer, integers. Um, so it's, it's, it is really type safe. Um, so we have this thing. Now what can we do with it? Um, well, I guess. Nothing. Nothing, <laughs> right. Um, now I'm going to publish it anyways. You know, it's, it's so easy. So I'm going to log in there. I'm going to create a new upload, which is a, a private repo where I can stage my module. And it's going to tell me, okay, this is the command line you need to be able to upload it. Okay, so I'm going at the command line. It's all dark, I can't see anything. So what, what is doing that? I just want you to remind, you know, remember how many kilometers of XML you have to do in Maven and settings.xml to actually publish an artifact somewhere or in a remote repository. Nice password. Yeah, it's the most common password on the internet. I figure that people are not going to you know, discover it. Uh, is it two, one? So no. say it's a bit like GitHub with the auto-completion of the various comments. So it's literally a say dash compile, but you, we have some uh, nice um, uh, bash extensions for that. All right, uh, we actually renamed it to Salon. So we have only one command called Salon, and then you have subcommands like you have in Git. So you can do salon help, and then it would tell you, okay, you can compile it, you can dock it, you can run it. So I compiled it here, and I told him to upload it directly here. Okay, so I have it here. I see that, you know, it did some checks, like I own this module, I'm allowed to publish it, and it's got a bunch of things. It's warning me because I didn't compile it for JavaScript as well. I didn't do the docs, but who cares? Let's publish it. All right. That's bad, man. Yeah, hey, you know, I... If there is garbage put in there, no, because we actually check who's allowed to publish on, on uh, modules. So we have here our two versions. So we have one here. It tells me that if I want to run it from the common line, then I need to do this bit of magic here. I'm, I'm using the distribution that I built uh, yesterday. So up. And now the command line will go fetch it directly from her and then uh, run it. You know, So everything is really integrated. So let's go back here. Uh, quickly, two words about the community. Uh, the language is open source. Everything is completely open. Um, we have some people from JBoss Red Hat, and we have contributors from anywhere. And, and perhaps you, you know, if, if you're looking for a, a nice project to occupy a few hours, then this is, this is one of those. Um, it's important when you're contributing to open source to, to have fun, so that's what we try to do, you know, make it uh, painless for people to contribute as much as possible, so we use the best tools for the job. Uh, we have also, it's, you know, contributing to so a language might sign, sound something like really hard, but it's, it's not rocket science. We have many small components that people can make a quick difference in. You know, we have the type checker, we have the uh, JVM compiler, the JavaScript compiler, we have the Eclipse IDE, we have a web IDE where you can try Salon code online. You can try it, it's pretty nice. It runs in your browser. We have Herd, which is a play uh, application. We have, uh, you know, the module system, tools to generate HTML, the command line, uh, you know, 
there's a lot of different types of things that you can do in there. By the way, we have a real, you know, real spec. It's not just a bunch of documentation put in that we call a spec. It's an actual right. spec. We also have documentation that is, you know, more readable, but. No, no, the, the Greek, no, we don't have the Greek to, no, to do I'm the not, proof. It's not just about Greek, you know, that. I mean, that I talked to Brian Gertz what he thinks about you, what you're doing, and he said, well, they, they seem to enjoy hacking, but they don't seem to have to underpinning in their particular type system. So, um, you know, that's, I think there's a question that people will ask. And, um, they seem to have what? I'm sorry? Well, that's that's that, that's a, okay. So, the, so that, that's not really true because we we actually have a few academics that worked on the type system and th that did verify that it's sound. You know, yeah, so. You, in your presentation, make this joke about, you know, this no, I only made the joke like about the Greek. Greek that's all. Right? Yeah. Then all right. No, no, it's not. No, we do care that the type system is sound, and it is. And you know, it's just the Greek we don't care about. Um, so let's see where we're at. So we have five milestones until we reach version one. Uh, milestones one and two are done. Milestones three is done as well. Uh, we have a, a lot of code already running, a lot of stuff already put in those milestones. And we have uh, the fourth milestone, which should arrive within a few weeks, um, probably two, three weeks, where we have, uh, um, again, uh, lots of new features. And the milestone five will be the final version before uh, version one. So in that one, we will get all the goodies, and then the re language will be ready to ship. Um, if you want to find more information, we have a website where we, you can find the blog, introduction, tour, reference. Uh, you can find all the downloads for Eclipse or the common line distribution, the API. Uh, Herd, of course, which is also online. And all the source code is on GitHub, so you can, you can hack into it. All the issues, uh, our issue tracker are also open, and the discussions uh, are held on public mailing lists. So whenever, you know, if, if there's something that you think we should change in the language or something that you like or dislike, then uh, don't hesitate to bring it up. And, um, and that's it. Yes, but if you have any questions. Yeah. Just before that, but back yeah. to the, you know, we're talking about the proof of the type system. That, that actually shows the variety of contribution you can make. So some people actually, don't run Ceylon or write some code, right? There's, for example, Rosted, which is a, an academic that actually worked on the on the type system and you know discussed that at length. Uh, some other person might work on Herd, which is made in Java at least uh, at least today, so it has nothing to do with Ceylon. We've got people contributing docs. We got, of course, people writing modules or write, you know working on the compiler. So there's. Like, you know, huge, huge variety of uh, things to do, and uh, and there is the and SDK, of course, as well. Yes, which is only Salon code. Yes. The JavaScript backend is that already running? Yes. Yes, so the we question, have. The question is: Is the JavaScript backend already running? Yeah, we the uh, the uh, JVM and the JavaScript compilers are both at the same level of completion. So whatever you can do in one, you can do in the other. And if you go on uh, uh, try.salonlang.org, you will have a web ID where you have nice color completion and, and, uh, com and even uh, command completion uh, uh, method, attribute completion, and, and um, hover docs and everything. So you can, you can actually run the Salon code directly in your browser, yes. Right, so the question is, what's the UI that we have in our SDK? Um, we, we don't have the UI yet done in the SDK. This is one bit that we didn't finish yet. Um, and the other question was, uh, do we need to depend on the SDK and the JDK? Um, no, the idea is that the SDK will have that and will have something based on either Swing or Java Fix. And, and that's what we want you to depend on because if you want to then run it on your browser, depending on the JDK, it doesn't make any sense because it's not there. No, the, the SDK module that gives you the uh, UI then can depend on something, but it could be implemented by, on the JVM by depending on Swing and on, uh, on uh, JavaScript by depending on uh, HTML, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, Canvas, right. 
Uh, generally speaking, that, that's a huge undertaking to try and say, hey, let's go and write a SDK. Um, so the strategy is going to to initially wrap you know, some of the library that are already available in Java, which of course depend on the SDK, right? Of course, those won't be able to won't be available as you know in JavaScript, but the goal down the road is to rewrite you know more and more of it in Ceylon. A bit like back in the Java day, you know we were we had like yeah. the 100% Java code versus pure Java or right, some part that were in C, right. some other part that were in uh, in Java. So we you know that's going to take a while, but that's that's a strategy. For, for instance, collections that are in the SDK, they're, they're not very complete yet, but they are not wrapping the JDK co collections. They're written in in 100% Salon, which means that you can also use them in JavaScript, which is pretty cool. Another question? Yes. Can I extend the Java class? Yes. We so the question is, can we extend the Java class? Yes. We're fully interoperable with Java, so you can extend Java classes, you can call Java classes, you can even uh, depend on Java modules that are actually Maven artifacts. So we would resolve it from the Maven repo and and let you touch it. Right. So, so the question is um, that do we support cyclic dependencies between Java and Salon in the IDE? And the answer is not yet. So we in the IDE, you can already have some Java code and call it from Salon code. But um, having cyclic uh, references where you call some, uh, where you depend on the Java class and the Java class depends on the Salon class, uh, this is something we will do for the Mazdon five. Yes. So today that should be just one way. If you if from Salon you depend on the Java class that you're that sits next to it, that works. Yes. No, and the beauty of having a modular SDK, so yeah, the question is that is the SDK going to be complete for Salon 1? And the answer is no, and that's the beauty of having a modular SDK from the start. It's that you, we don't need to. You know, we can ship version 1 with an SDK that is not finished, and then as, as it appears, as it matures, then you only need to update your module dependencies and you will get the new version. You don't need to wait for Salon version 2 to get the, the newest and greatest version of Salon.net. Yes. Can we call an Java method? You, the question is, can we call overloaded Java methods? And the answer is yes. Any other question? Any real world usage? Uh, the, okay. So the question is, any real world usage? The uh, you know, if this thing is not final yet, right? We're at milestone. Uh, I just said the three. NYSE actually runs. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no. <laughs> Um, if you're asking me if it's the right time now to write uh, to use Salon in production, then the answer is no. That would be crazy, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so no. Let's uh, wait until Salon is version one, and then we can talk. But uh, but we do have a lot of code already in the SDK, so we do have a lot of usage, and and that that uh, is looking pretty is, good. Is it the right time to write a module to get a feel of Salon and you know contribute to the what would become yeah. the SDK? The, the answer is yes. That the language and the compiler are the are at a very mature level. So if you have a few hours of spare time, that's definitely the right time to go and have yeah. fun. It's probably the best time as well because we're not at version one yet. So if you find something that you think we should really change, you know that it's still time to to try to convince us. Even at the language level. Yeah. You mean. Yes. Regarding vulnerability, uh, do you have the uh, ability to distinguish between a non null array of string and an array of non null string? Uh, so the question is, can we have, can we make the distinction between uh, an array of non-null strings and an array of uh, nullable strings, optional strings? Um, if I recall correctly, we we can, but I think the interface of array is defined in such a way that um, we don't that that getting items from the array can return nil anyways if you hit outside of the bounds. So it's not going to help you a lot. So you always Rather than a throwing an uh, illegal uh, array index exception. But, but if you write your own custom array that yeah. would never have this kind of problem, then yes, you can differentiate uh, the two use cases. Can you put the question mark behind the brackets? 
No, the, the, I don't think that's the exact question, but, but if, yes, we can put question marks anywhere. And it's just an alias for or nothing. So you, yeah. Oh, and by the way, we have generics. I don't think we, we showed them, but we have a simpler, I mean, a more natural and understandable version of generics uh, than Java, I mean. Uh, the question is, how do we do deal with variants? Um, that's a good question because we in, in Java you deal with variants at the call site, where you define wildcards and then you say extends or super, um, and that's uh, something that is usually confusing to to people. So what we did is that we moved the variants to the decoration side of the parameters, where you say hey, I'm, I have a type map that is parameterized on key and value. And you can say that key is an in parameter, so it has to be a contravariant, or it's an out parameter, it has to be covariant. So it's, um, the variance is done where you define the type and not where you use it, which makes it for a lot simpler usage. Exclusively? Yes. Call side variants. Yeah, but there, there's a lot of things about Java generics that were not good ideas, but you know, made sense because of backwards compatibility uh, issues at the time. By the way, you know. big disclaimer, we like, love Java, right? Yeah, we, uh, obviously we love Java. You know, all, all of the reasons which made Java so cool in 95 still stand today. You know, things like trying to make it readable, trying to, to mm -hmm. limit the number of things you can do in the language and, and the number of things you can do wrong. You know, that's something that we're heavily inspired by. And, and to get back to generics, like, we will have reified generics in Salon as well. How is that as a bytecode uh, on the JVM level when the JVM doesn't really have a notion of that? Well, the question is how do we do reified generics at the bytecode level? And, and, and the other question is, well, how, how do we do mix-ins at the bytecode level? How do we do closures at the bytecode level? You know, there's, you can't, so you trick it. <laughs> But we got pretty good support for uh, uh, interoperability between the, the, the Java generics and the Ceylon yes. generics, right? Yes. Well, uh, well, All right, so, so for um, interoperability uh, with Java, which requires um, uh, call side variance, then we are discussing now whether we do it by magic, you know, where the compiler will just guess what you're trying to do. Um, by the way, the, the question only happens with inheritance. So whenever you're inheriting an interface that has constraints of call side variance, then that happens. But the compiler can guess. You know, it looks at the, the, the signatures and just generates compatible signatures. You don't even have to see it. Uh, but it's a bit of black magic, so we're also thinking of adding annotations. You know, compiler, we, we have annotations, so we can annotate anything. We could let you annotate it, the type at the call site, and say that, well, the JavaScript compiler will ignore this, but the JVM compiler will generate the proper wildcard so that the signature matches. But, you know, this is something that you don't need in Salon. You only need it for interrupt. So we're trying to make it as you know, as easy as possible, but also not pollute the type system for, you know, if you're not using it for interop, you don't need to pollute the type system for that. Well, let's call it a day. Thank you very much for all the questions that were actually very interesting. Yeah, very good questions today. Thank you very Thank much. You.